get to the right message here. Give you the right message. Something about grace. Yes, we're continuing to talk about grace. And it's my heart and my prayer that you are growing in your understanding of just how amazing and great God's grace is. I want to ask you a question. Did you ever have a moment in your life where everything just changed? Where you experienced something or something happened and it was a very much a defining moment in your life. Anybody have a moment like that? Alright, I can tell you this. The moment that I saw Laura or remember seeing her for the first time was a very defining moment. I was uh, wor working in uh, the campus pastor's office at Liberty University and we worked with student leaders and, and one day I, I stopped in the leadership meeting and I was looking around and, and I said to the, uh, the guy that I worked with, I said, who is that girl up there? She doesn't usually come to this meeting and he says, I don't know who she is and I said, we need to find out who she is. <laughs> All right, and I didn't stalk her, it wasn't like that. <clears throat> we did gather some information but it was not stalking, I promise. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit. but. But it really was a moment where I was very intrigued and obviously based on that moment and moments afterwards it was a very defining and changing moment in my life and seeing grace for what it is, I believe, can be the same way in our lives. That when we really come to a place where we understand and see God's grace for what it is, it really can be that defining moment in our life where we understand who God is. And not only do we understand who God is, but we understand how God sees us. Because it's so important for you and I to see ourselves the way God sees us. Because it's in that that we find the answer to the, a lot of the questions that either we ask in life or we'll find out that other people are asking. And here's just some of those questions that people ask in life. Maybe you've asked these questions, but certainly you know people who do. Things like, do I matter? In a world where there are seven billion people, do I really matter? And do I matter to God? Does my life count? Does my life count? Will my life really make a difference? In this world, does my life count? Some people ask the question, does God notice me? Did you ever feel like maybe God just wasn't noticing you? Anybody? Alright, maybe you just felt like he had overlooked your situation or your circumstances. That, that maybe you, you didn't doubt that he loved or cared, but you just thought maybe at the moment he's busy with so many other things that he's not really noticing what's going on. Maybe you've wrestled with this question. Am I a failure? Maybe it's something that happened. Maybe it's a sin that you struggled with. Or maybe something happened where you didn't measure up to someone's expectations. And you felt like maybe... I'm a failure. And some of us have wrestled with this question. Does God still love me? Or does God love me? Maybe he loved me at one time, but does he still love me, even though I've done some things that I shouldn't have done? And this morning, I want to bring your attention to a particular aspect of how God sees you in order that we can answer these questions. And I want to begin in John chapter 1 and then we're going to move into the book of Ephesians this morning. But John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, it says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, so everyone who's come to faith in Christ, it says he gave the right to become children of God. Now how many of you have, are familiar with the concept of being a child of God? All right. It's not a foreign concept. It's something we're all familiar with. It's terminology we use all the time, this child of God you know, terminology. But have you ever really just taken some time to think about the implications that God chooses to view you as his child? You know, it's so common for us to call ourselves the children of God that sometimes I think we don't realize the weight of what it means to be God's child. And this morning I want to even focus a little bit more finely and more in tune to the sense that God doesn't just see you as any sort of child. He sees you as an adopted child. And there's significance in that. You see, grace makes us a child of God. 
Grace makes us, grace brings us into a relationship where we are God's child. He hangs his grace happens here sign on our lives. And he makes us his child. But not just any child. You are an adopted child. Let's uh, jump over to Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1. And let's just look at uh, verses 4 and 5 for right now. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and he says, Long ago, even before that he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So in John chapter 1, John says, When we've accepted him or believed in him, that's our responsibility in salvation. And God's part of salvation is that he chose us, right? In Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family. Check that out. To adopt us into his family. By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. That word literally means delight. Isn't that an amazing thought? That God delights in you and in me. He takes pleasure in you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you responded to God in faith, you've understood that you're a sinner, you understood that that means you're separated from God, but you realize that Jesus came to end that separation, that He absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf, He died for your sin and for my sin, He rose from the dead, and if you've placed your faith in Him and in Him alone, I want you to know this morning that you are God's child. And you're not just God's child, you're his adopted child. And that changes everything. Because grace changes your label and it changes your story. We talked about Ruth a couple days ago. And how God intersected her life and he changed her label and he changed her story. Remember she was the Moabite, the outsider. The one who had no right or stake and claim in the kingdom of God. And yet God in his grace provided her a redeemer and he brought her into the family and he wrote her into his story. Remember that? He wrote her into the very lineage of Christ because remember Ruth had a great grandson named David. You see, that's what grace does. It writes us into the story of God. And Paul frames our role in the story by saying this, that God had a plan to bring us into his story. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it was God's plan, God's choice, to bring you into the story that he is writing. And it says he did that because he loved you. And he chose you. He loved you and he chose you and he's writing you into his story. You are an object of God's love. It's a very basic concept but we can miss it because it's so familiar. God loves you. You were chosen by him. He wanted you. Do you get that this morning? God wanted you. And so he chose you in Christ to be his child, to be part of his story, and to live a new life in that story. You see, grace changes our label, it changes our identity, and it changes our story. And God wants us to live out that story. Look at, look at what it says. See, because once we get adopted into the family of God, God gives you a new story to live. And he doesn't want you to live your old story anymore. He wants you to live this new story that he's writing. He says, he chose you to be holy. He chose you to be holy. That means to be set apart. How many of you have dishes at home that you don't use on a regular basis? All right. They're set apart. But when you have company over, right, you get the special dishes out and you have to wash them what? Before and after, right? Even though they're already clean, your mom says, we got to wash these dishes. There might be some dust on them. And so we get the special, the special dishes out, the china, and because we want our guests to feel special. Well, those dishes are set apart for special use. And in the same way, God wants you to see yourself that way. You have been set apart for special use. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. You are chosen to be holy. Literally, you are considered to be a saint. Think about that. That's your label now. So just take your name and put saint in front of it. All right? That can be all of our title now. So if you need a title, you know, Luke back there, that's Saint Luke back there. All right? All right? I'm Saint Dan. All right? That's how you can refer to me now. <laughs> Please know that I'm kidding. 
but it is part of our identity. It's part of how God sees you. It's part of how God chose you. You are chosen to be holy. It's not just a standard that God's asking you to reach. It's how he already sees you. God sees you as holy and set apart. He sees you as blameless. He chose you to be holy and blameless. This means without blemish and without fault. And listen, it's not just a goal. It's how God already sees you. Because when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ with which he's clothed you. And he sees a child, an adopted child, a chosen child that he loves very much. You see, understanding who you are empowers you to live out your identity. See, that's the thing. I want you to be able to leave this place, whether it's this Saturday or in a week or two weeks, and to be able to live out this story of grace that God is wanting to write in your life. And understanding who you are, understanding how God sees you, is how you will be able to do that. Because it's when we understand who God has made us to be that we're able to live out who we are. You see, you're adopted. Chosen. Isn't that an amazing thought? See, we have two children. And, and when they were born, they didn't give us the option of whether we would take them home or not. We had to take them home. <laughs> Does that make sense? Now, don't think I'm cruel. I wanted to take them home. This was uh, my first, Lena Joy, the four-year-old that you see running around now. That was her back in, on August 5th of 2009. And of course you can tell that even though I didn't have a choice whether to take her home, I did want to take her home. And this was Evan Daniel a few years later. And so you can see there, there wasn't any chance in the world that I was going to leave them at the hospital, right? And nor was their mama. But whether we wanted them or not, they were ours. Right? And sometimes we speak of children as what? Being sort of a whoops. Some of you might be a whoops, right? In your mom's eyes. <laughs> All right? Even though we know how it happens, right? You know, we say whoops. But there's, listen, there's no accidental adoptions. And here's the thing. God, there's no accidents with God either. We, we might describe a pregnancy as a whoops, but God never thinks of it that way. Ever. But here's the thing. There are no accidental adoptions. You don't get accidentally adopted, do you? All right, adoption is a choice. And it's an amazing picture. Because it's a thought out and a planned choice. And it's how God wants you to see yourself. Look back at verse 5. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. And that gave him great pleasure. Listen, he chose you. And he chose you even though he knew everything about you. He knew all about your past when he chose you. He knew all about your present. And listen, he knew all about your future. He knew about the fact that you would still fail him and you would still mess up even after he chose you and showed you his love. And guess what? He still chose you and he still chooses you. I appreciated what Janice shared last night during uh, sing time about God's love. And it's not the fact that he just loved us first in the past, but he loves us first now. And God still chooses you. He does not regret his choice to choose you. You know, sometimes we think, you know, maybe I failed God and I haven't really lived out this life that he's called me to live very well. And maybe God regrets choosing, but here's the thing. He never, ever regrets choosing you and he would still choose you and he still does choose you. And adoption is something that God wants you to understand because he adopted you into his family. You're his child. And listen, adoption's expensive. The average cost of adoption today in the United States is somewhere around thirty-three dollars to $35,000. That's what it costs to adopt a child. That's a lot of money. But I want you to know that you were purchased by God at a much higher cost. It cost God the life of his son. It cost Jesus everything. But God was willing to pay that price for you. That's the price that God valued you with. The life of his son. Do you see yourself that way? God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. You're adopted into the family and you have been purchased. 
with a great price. And there's no regret on God's part. How many of you have ever bought something and maybe you spent a lot of money on it, your parents spent a lot of money on it, and then you really, it really just wasn't everything you thought it was going to be. And you sort of regretted it. Anybody? All right, sometimes, the, you know, we want something so bad and we just think, if I just get this thing, it's going to be so exciting and so great, but it just doesn't end up being everything that we hoped it would be. And we call that sort of buyer's remorse or buyer's regret. But God does, nev God does not have buyer's remorse when it comes to you. You see, he paid an infinite cost for you and he doesn't regret it. God never regrets choosing you. There are no accidental adoptions. He doesn't regret choosing you. He never, ever regrets choosing you. In fact, what did it say in verse 5? That choosing you brought God great pleasure. Isn't that amazing? That choosing you, God says it brings him great pleasure. I don't know how it is that you view yourself. I don't know how it is that you see yourself. But more than anything this morning, I want you to be able to see yourself the way God sees you. You know, sometimes when we look at our lives, it's so easy to believe Satan's lies. It's so easy to believe the lies that he wants us to believe about ourselves. But God wants you to live in his truth and in his grace. And he wants you to know that you are in Christ. God loves you. He chose you. He adopted you. He wanted you. It's his unchanging plan to adopt you into the family. I want you to define your life by the reality of what God says about you. Not about what you think about yourself, not about what others say about you, but what God says about you. You are his adopted child. So remember those questions? There's one answer to each of them. Do I matter? God chose you. Does my life count? What's the answer? God chose me. God chose me. Does my life count? Am I here to make it? Absolutely, because God chose me. Does God notice me? Does he see the things that I'm going through? Does he see the hurt and the pain in my life? Absolutely. Does he know me? Absolutely. He chose you. And he knows everything about you. He knows when you get up. He knows when you go to bed. He knows everything that goes on. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He has them numbered. Isn't that a, just a, a crazy thought? That the God of the universe, who's so vast and so big and so powerful, knows how many hairs are on your head. He cares about every detail of your life. Am I a failure? God chose you. Listen, you are going to fail at things in life. I have failed at a lot of things in life. But I am not a failure. And neither are you in Christ. That's not your identity. You are not a failure. You are not a sum of the mistakes that you have made in this life. You are not a math equation where all your mistakes get added up and that's who you are. That's not what grace is all about. You are not a failure. You are not a mistake. You're not an accident. God chose you and he loves you. Listen, I, I love my little kids so, so much. And I didn't even choose them. They just came. Right? I didn't choose them. God gave them to us as his blessings and his gifts. But my love for them is so, so less significant than God's love for you. Because my love for them isn't perfect. But God's love for you is perfect. You're not a failure. No matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what sin has entered your life, no matter how far you think you may have fallen short of pleasing God, you are not a failure. You are loved. You bring God. He smiles when he looks at you. When he sees you playing your music, he smiles at you. And he looks at you with favor and approval. When he sees you playing frisbee, he smiles. And he wa enjoys watching his children run around and have a great time. I love seeing my kids laugh. I love it when they're happy. And God feels the same way about you. He chose you. Does God love me? Does he really love me? 
Just remember this. He chose you. See, grace requires us to change our attitude about ourselves. Grace is an invitation to see your life not for how the world sees it or even you see it, but how God sees it. And here's the thing. Your identity is not in your possessions. This world will tell you that, that your identity is found in how much stuff you accumulate while you're here on earth. And that is not your identity if you're in Christ. Your identity is not in your talent. Some of you are amazingly talented. God has given you this talent to use for his glory. And that's a fantastic thing. But that's not your identity. That's not what defines you. Your talent does not define you. Your relationship status does not define you. All right? Our, our world says today, you, you're defined by your relationship status. You are not defined by your relationship status. You are not defined by your sexuality. That's another lie that the world says. Hey, define yourself by your sexuality. That's what life's all about. Absolutely not true. You're not defined by your degrees. Right? I'm not defined by how many degrees I have from this institution or that. They're wonderful things. They're tools to grow and prepare for what God's called us to do, but they're not what defines us. And you're not defined by your accomplishments. The things that we accomplish are for God's glory and by His grace, but they don't define us. And neither are we defined by our failures. You are defined by grace. And grace says you are chosen, adopted into the family of God. A choice that God made. And he loves you. And his grace is greater than all your sin. All your mistakes. And God wants you to live out this new identity. Right? He wants grace to change your label and change your story. And I want you to be able to live out the story of grace when you go home. I want you to be able to live out this story that God's writing. You are holy and blameless. And so that's a call to live that way. God already sees you like that. And then he asks you to follow him, to trust him, and to live out your identity. He wants your life to be filled with the knowledge that you are his adopted child. That you are chosen and loved. And this causes us to see the world differently, right? When we go home, we can look at people and say, I want to reflect the reality that God has been gracious to me. And so now I can be gracious to them. I can reflect this love that I've experienced to a world that desperately needs to see it. God will position you to be in people's lives that no one else will be in where you can reflect his love and his grace. God wants you to be a child that reflects his grace to this world. And what a difference God can make through you when you live out your identity. Would you bow your heads this morning? I just want us to, to take a, a few moments this morning to really just stop and, and to think about how God sees you. I don't know how it is that you have always pictured God looking at you. But I want you to know that he looks at you with eyes of love and grace. He knew all about you. Past, present, and future. And he chose you. And he still chooses you today. He does not regret his choice. I want you to just take a moment and however you choose to picture Jesus, I just want you to picture him this morning. And I want you to see him looking at you with eyes of love, with eyes of affection, with eyes of grace. Just, if you were here last week with us, just the way he looked at that woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8, drug into the temple that morning, looked at with scorn and derision by the people who were supposed to represent God. The people that had rocks in their hand, ready to condemn her. And Jesus looked at her. And he said, where are your accusers? And then he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And I believe that she was able to look into the eyes of her Savior and see a love that she had never, ever felt before. To see grace that she had never known. And I believe it radically changed her life. And that's what God wants to do in your life. And so would you just take a moment and picture that this morning? Father, I just pray this morning that you would help each and every one of us to understand how you see us. And Father, we, we talk a lot about being your children. But Father, I don't know that we really spend a lot of time deeply thinking about what that means.
And so, Father, I pray that today that you would open our hearts to really understand what it means to be your child. And to understand that we are your children by choice, through adoption. Father, I thank you that you are willing to pay an infinite price for me and for each person in this room. Father, I pray that we would never ever lose sight of the love that you have towards us and the willingness that you had to pay for our sin and to adopt us into your family. Father, I thank you that you take our old labels and you wipe them away and you give us new labels, holy and blameless. And Father, I pray that we would see ourselves through those labels and through those, I, that identity so that we can live out your story of grace. And Father, I just pray that you'd help everyone in here this morning to know that you love them, that you chose them, and that there's nothing that will ever, ever change that. Father, may we be overcome by your grace. And Father, may by that grace we live out this new story that you have made available to us, a story of grace. A story of a life that, that is now lived for your glory. Now lived for your purpose. By your power. Not because we have to, but because we can. And because you've called us to it. And because you love us with such a great love. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.